Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and The Mandalorian Season 2 followed up its recent trailer with more footage in a Disney Plus promo that you might have missed because Wanda and Vision kind of dominated headlines with their silly Halloween costumes. But uh, you really should check this out. You may think you have some idea what you are in possession of, but you do not. Hamilton? Black Beauty? Dad, get that non-Star Wars stuff out of this cantina. What else have we got here? Wherever I go, he goes. So, in this footage, we finally hear the voice of Dark Saber Wield and Moff Gideon, although this exact audio was a line from the final minutes of Episode 7 last season. You may think you have some idea of what you are in possession of, but you do not. There's also this shot of Mando on the speeder bike on Tatooine, which, upon closer examination, appears to be toting some familiar cargo. On the far back of that bike looks like armor with a blue and orange apparatus very similar to the Z6 jetpack famously worn by Boba Fett. And to the slight right, you can also see what looks like Boba Fett's Mandalorian helmet facing toward the bike. These new details do clarify a lot of the findings I was able to dig up in my in-depth analysis of the trailer. So here, I'm now gonna break down what this all means, how it's all connected. Spoiler warning in case you wanna go into Mando season two blind. So I was previously brainstorming that maybe the planet with the town that Mando and Baby Yoda are visiting in the trailer could be Lothal, which I pronounced perfectly in the last video, the home of Ezra Bridger in Star Wars Rebels, a planet known to be rich in the the Dunium Ore used in Star Destroyer construction, and a Jedi Temple with possible links to the Yoda species origin. But along with those creepy Jawa eyes from the shadows, pay close attention to the moment Mando strings up that other figure. Yeah, that uh... <laughs> That's the distinctive bellow of a Tusken Raider. And while Jawas are known to be nomadic traders who show up on multiple planets, it's just a bit more rare to see Tusken Raiders anywhere other than a desert planet like Tatooine. Also, that clearly anti-imperial graffiti on the walls corresponds to the violent Stormtrooper Pike display seen on Tatooine last season. These folks hate imps and they aren't afraid to let you know. You know, it'd be great if we could just ask this dude what planet we're on, but I don't speak Tuscan. Luckily, language barriers are a thing of the past thanks to our sponsor, Babbel, the number one language learning app in the world. Right now, I am not able to travel internationally, but it is something I really love. So I've been prepping for my next trip by brushing up on some German using Babbel. So that when I'm finally able to visit a new country again, I'll be able to get around and connect with the locals. That's what Babbel specializes in, as it's aimed at preparing preparing you for real life encounters and situations. It also has no ads. Those are real life encounters I'm already getting plenty of. Like here's my Babbel German course. It goes, hello, Eric. You'll learn how to greet people informally and ask people how they're doing, which is, you know, step one anytime you're traveling internationally. It also gives you a nifty sound check so you know how to say the German I, because vowels are different in other languages. I've played around with learning through an app before, but the free apps seem too basic and really not that effective. Babbel is way better than other apps and learning methods. Actually, university studies have shown that 15 hours of using Babbel is the equivalent of a semester of college Spanish. Think about it, 15 hours? That's like 30 minutes a day for like 30 days. Yeah, yeah. Head to my link below right now to get 50% off for six months for a limited time only. Click that link in the description to start learning with Babbel today. So yes, this planet on the Mandalorian season two trailer, most likely Tatooine. And I believe this leads directly to Mando entering that fighting arena where he meets with Gore Koresh, the Abyssian a Cyclops species we have actually seen another member of on Tatooine and the sparring Gamorreans, another species we have seen on Tatooine. And I believe this whole room, all these colorful characters, could be the remnants of the gang of Jabba the Hutt, filling the void of spice running and organized crime on Tatooine in the five years since Jabba died in the opening act of Return of the Jedi. All of these criminals now reorganized under different leadership. Actually, if you look on the far side of that fighting ring, there is a pale figure with long appendages, not unlike the Laku of a male Twi'lek, perhaps even those of Bib Fortuna, top advisor to Jabba the Hutt. It was for a time believed that Fortuna died when the sail barge exploded, but as is the case for pretty much every Star Wars character, there exists a legend's backstory detailing Fortuna's secret plot to betray and to assassinate Jabba the Hutt. Luke's arrival diverted this plan, and after Leia strangled Jabba, Fortuna actually escaped that exploding yacht 
shot and return to Jabba's palace, where the Bomar monks he conspired with arrive to steal his brain for their spider droid walkers. It's a fun one. Now, maybe this is Fortuna here, maybe it isn't. But yeah, the leftover elements of Jabba's syndicate would be the criminal entity Mando would check in with on Tatooine. If you read Chuck Wendig's aftermath, described how after the Galactic Civil War, the huts were in disarray, overtaken by Nikto crime cartels. This could be the organization Gore Koresh now represents. Notice their exchange, it's interesting. You know this is no place for a child. Wherever I go, he goes. So I've heard. Which poses the question, where did Gore Koresh hear that? Mando's reputation must precede him, implying that his last trip to Tatooine in episode five of last season left an impression with people like Pelimoto, Fennec Shand, whom we believe to now be in the hands of Boba Fett based on some clues in that final shot of that episode. Check out my breakdown for those clues. But yeah, that moment was absolutely a loose thread that season two will almost certainly explore. If for no other reason, then Boba Fett's Mandalorian armor is Beskar that Din Djarin would be eager to get his hands on to return to the armorer. Since this Mandalorian sect believes that all Beskar in the universe was stolen from the Mandalorian people. This could be part of what we're seeing here on the speeder bike, if indeed that is Boba Fett's jetpack and helmet. Now, an important question. If you were to take Boba Fett's armor from him, is he still Boba Fett? Like, is he still the Boba Fett that we know and love and are willing to pay $7 a month to Disney Plus to watch? On one hand, yeah, totally, Tamar Morrison could still act the shit out of this bounty hunter, armor or no armor. And yeah, the prequels established Boba's background as that stink face little clone ward of Jango Fett on Kamino. But on the other hand, the whole whole appeal of Boba Fett is really that Mandalorian helmet, let's be honest. The helmet, the gear, the weaponry, Slave One. He's a man of few words. He's a strutting mystery we hardly got to know and really probably never want to know that much about. That's why he's fun. It's really honestly the same appeal that Dave Filoni and Jon Favreau are using for the Mandalorian Din Djarin, who, despite Pedro Pascal's indelible charm, remains, in my opinion, a far more intriguing character when the helmet is left on. We actually have an episode of Big Question coming up in the pipeline explaining how and why the Mandalorian series is kind of changing the rules of why these Mandalorian characters hide their faces under their helmets compared to the Mandalorians of the animated series, which uh, I guess aren't afraid of a little vitamin D. So instead, I think Mando's attempt to track down Fennec Shand will lead to a struggle in which Mando tries to take back Boba Fett's Beskar armor, but Boba Fett offers him something in exchange for that armor back so that he could get restored in that iconic look that we all have action figures of, but in a plot that still explains why they would need Morrison to be cast in this role. And the price Boba Fett pays to get his armor back? Information. The location of Boba Fett's origin planet, Kamino, the old cloning facility that was so secret it didn't even show up on the Jedi Archive star maps. Perhaps the archives are incomplete. If an item does not appear in our records, it does not exist. <laughs> Jocasta knew. Okay, Boomer. Last season, Dr. Pershing wore Kamino insignia when he was running those tests on Baby Yoda, leading many of us to believe that Baby Yoda could have been genetically engineered on Kamino, especially since cloning technology was an ongoing thing in the Star Wars universe established by the Rise of Skywalker. Somehow Palpatine returned. Dark science. Cloning. Secrets only the Sith knew. I'm sorry if that triggered you. Now, yes, Kuil did suggest that Baby Yoda didn't look genetically engineered. I don't think it was engineered. I've worked in the gene farms. This one looks evolved. But Blurg herders are probably wrong about a lot of things, and that Kamino patch meant something. Maybe this Mandalorian season will head to Kamino, but ultimately I suspect, I hope, that Baby Yoda's origin, while maybe connected to genetic engineering, is a bit more complex than Yoda clone. Just surprise us, Filoni. You can discuss these theories with me on New Rockstar's official Discord server by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash newrockstars. Subscribe to New Rockstars, hit that notification bell, follow me on Instagram at EA Voss, follow New Rockstars. Thanks for watching. I have spoken.